read about the ice truckers who haul their precious cargoes across frozen lakes and tundra in the Arctic Circle, or those heroes who service remote islands in the Pacific, or who fly into inaccessible airstrips in the rainforests, they're all doing a tough job undoubtedly. But we should accept that perhaps the hardest haulage challenge in the world has to be that of getting a seven-year-old child back to school after the spring break. Motivating muscles to power little legs schoolward, even if the journey is downhill, and placing a smile of anticipation on her face at the prospect of six hours experiencing the joys of learning isn't an easy task. So in one of my many desperate attempts to put a spring back in her step, if not in the broader British climate, uh, was to suggest that we invent some crazy new things as we trudged our way down to school. Come up with some ideas for wild inventions. The less practical, the more outlandish, the better. The exercise worked in terms of smoothing the school journey and distracting a daughter. But it also got me thinking. We spend so much of our time thinking about important innovation, maybe we should spare a thought for what might be called irrelevant innovation and explore around the edges of this phenomenon. Is it all wacky stuff? Or are there circumstances where it has more to offer? Is it a matter of framing? Are we missing an innovation trick or two by dismissing such ideas too early? So here's a suggested outline typology, a first shot at mapping the territory. Feel free to add your own examples and categories. So let's start with WTF. Now, these are the ideas that leap out at you from the screen or jump up from the page with a fistful of questions. Like, what were they thinking of? Who dreamed this up? Uh, and what were they on at the time? And uh, uh, who on earth would want this? Or maybe just a pure, simple, and very large why. For example, patenting the cheese flavored cigarette or the musical flamethrower. Now, sometimes a closer look might reveal the originator's tongue firmly wedged in their cheek. Uh, these are elaborate jokes and nudges to remind us not to take innovation life too seriously. But all too often they have the stamp of sincerity about them. Someone really believes that what the world needs now is their invention. Like, for example, the urban window baby cage, in which, for high-rise apartment dwellers, your child can get plenty of fresh air by being suspended outside the window hundreds of feet off the ground. Now, these ones are easy to spot, and we can throw them in the rubbish bin, but maybe we shouldn't be too quick to apply our BS filters and dismiss them out of hand. After all, history reminds us that sometimes we need visionaries, those who can see into the future and bring back wild ideas which become part of that future. Apple's famous ad campaign around Think Different and Richard Dreyfus turning our collective heads towards the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. Which echoes the great playwright George Bernard Shaw's observation that all progress depends on unreasonable men. Trouble is that the line between crazy and visionary is often vanishingly thin. Think about Nikolai Tesla, who did a lot more than just lend his name to a car brand. Without his insights, we wouldn't have much of the electricity generation technology that we rely on today. Not to mention valuable innovations around radio, lighting, transportation, and so on. But we didn't get earthquake generating machines, thought cameras, death beams, supersonic airships, or artificial tidal waves, which may be a good thing. Melissa Schilling, in her excellent book of the same name, classes people like Tesla as quirky, and that word captures their character traits well. It is also worth noting that we tend to label ordinary folk who come up with oddball stuff as variations on crazy. Uh, but if the ideas originate from billionaires who've built their fortune on innovation, uh, we use the much more forgiving eccentric description. Well, our second class would be what we might call bouncing back off the wall. 
that you can almost see the creative moment late at night, fueled by questionable alcohol or other stimulants, that point where the conversation explodes around a key wild thought, like uh, let's convince people that what they really need is a pet rock. Innovations of this kind start life as a crazy idea, but somehow along the way, they acquire a momentum of their own. A community of users, or perhaps co-conspirators, emerges, which brings the thing to life and creates its own use case. Gary Dahl's madcap idea about pet rocks led to him selling over 10,000 of them every day. At the height of the craze, several tons of nearly 2 million of them were being adopted. You can still buy one today if you're wanting a low maintenance companion. Or how about changing your eating habits and improving your digestion by using a slow fork next time you sit down to a meal? Or a no phone. Looks like the real thing, but actually has zero functionality inside. Or the selfie toaster, which produces toast with your image on it. Our third group we could call following the yellow brick road. Sometimes innovations build on well-established trajectories, but lead us to unexpected and sometimes irrelevant places. Packaging offers plenty of examples. It's become a huge industry and of central importance in food retailing and distribution to help preserve integrity, freshness, and safety. But take a closer look at the contents of your supermarket trolley or your home delivery order. Do we really need our bananas to be shrink-wrapped and packaged in plastic and a cardboard? Or whole nuts inside cartons? It took nature several million years to evolve some kind of useful natural protection do we really need to update it? Do we need a personal pocket water spray when we could splash ourselves at the sink? Or leaf blowers that serve to create miniature sandstorms? Hmm? Another class is what we might call on second thoughts. Confession time. In my research on wacky innovations, I came across several Japanese sites which feature oddball innovations, including a miniature umbrella which you could wear as a kind of hat. Now, who would ever really want something like that, and why? Some rapid reframing was in order, however, when my wife not only bought one enthusiastically, but then proceeded to deploy it in the garden, demonstrating its considerable advantages over hats, which fall off, or hooded jackets, which lock your arms up in a straight jacket and obscure your vision. This umbrella device keeps her dry enough for even the most delicate gardening tasks and made me rapidly revise my estimate of it. Now, innovations like these might appear unnecessary, but sometimes there's more to them. Beauty, or at least the value, really is in the eye of the beholder. And maybe we need to practice a little reframing. Maybe the floor cleaning onesie a baby outfit which polishes your floors while your offspring are crawling around on them. Maybe that isn't such a bad idea after all. Hmm. Our fifth category, string and sealing wax creations. Now, necessity, or sometimes frustration, is a very fecund mother of invention. And this plays out big time in the world of user innovation. As extensive research has shown, users are responsible for a significant amount of product and process innovation. Studies suggest that over 20% of new products and an even higher proportion of process innovations originate in the hands and minds of users because they're actively seeking a solution to a problem which bothers them. Couple this with a tolerance for imperfection, they're happy to experiment with prototypes which work even if they look a bit odd and lack design elegance. So many of those early hacks and minimum viable workarounds might look crazy, but they could be the start of something which becomes a mainstream innovation. Think of where many new sports, things like skateboarding or windsurfing, originate, or where childcare innovations, like collapsible buggies or disposable diapers, where these things began and the oddball user is often clearly in view in the background. Category number six hmm, seemed like a good idea at the time. 
Sometimes, back to trajectories again, we can extrapolate trends to create apparently interesting opportunities and then go on to innovate something irrelevant. The wonderful Museum of Failure in Sweden and online has plenty of examples you can see, including a sizable number from big companies. For example, anticipating the time-poor commuters across big cities like New York and recognizing the nutritional challenges in a diet consisting of snatch snacks, the food giant Gerber came up with a line of quality adult foods which could be consumed quickly from a jar, sort of spooning up adult baby food in grown-up flavors like Mediterranean vegetables. Perhaps not surprisingly, it didn't take off. And despite having proved his innovation skills in the field of home computers, where his ZX80 range opened up the mass market for the product, Clive Sinclair's venture into electromobility, the C5, became a byword for how not to do innovation. At some point, some kind of reality distortion field seems to come into play for the innovators. An experience well documented in the excellent history of the Segway personal transportation system that somehow never quite happened. Group 7. Wrong place, wrong time. Timing in innovation, as much as in stand-up comedy, is everything. And sometimes the great idea on which many people have worked arrives perfectly formed, well thought out, but a totally the wrong moment. Take the Bristol Brabazon, originally conceived as a breakthrough aeroplane design to exploit the anticipated huge market growth in long-haul international air travel in the post-war period. Based on a design for a giant long-range bomber which was approved by the Ministry of Aviation in the UK in 1943, the plane took shape in consultation with the British National Airline British Overseas Airways Corporation. Like many projects, it took on a life of its own. The budget rapidly escalated with the construction of new facilities to accommodate such a large plane. And at one stage, it even involved the demolition of an entire village in order to extend the runway at Filton near Bristol. Many unnecessary features were included. For example, the mock-up contained a most magnificent ladies' powder room with wooden aluminium painted mirrors and even receptacles for the various lotions and powders used by the modern young lady. The prototype took six and a half years to build and involved major technical crises with wings and engine design, but eventually it flew and very well. The only problem was that the character of the post-war aircraft market was very different from that envisaged by the technologists and in 1952, after flying less than 1,000 miles, the project was abandoned at considerable cost to the taxpayer. Uh, number eight is a little similar about time, this time coming too early to the party. Because sometimes it's the other way around. Innovations arriving ahead of rather than behind their time and looking round in embarrassment at the handful of other early bird party guests, trying to interest them. Markets that have yet to materialize, or very often technologies that have yet to mature. Step forward Apple and the Newton, or Google and their glasses. These are examples where the particular embodiment of the innovation didn't quite make it and appeared unnecessary or irrelevant, but where the learning acquired through such failure has proved invaluable in terms of shaping future successful directions. And we should also think about blind spots. Spare a thought for the otherwise great ideas which suffer from a lack of insight into the context in which they might find themselves. For example, there are plenty of cases where a simple and apparently useful name can turn out to have unfortunate consequences when placed in a different linguistic or cultural zone. Think of French kids growing up, happily slurping away a fizzy drink with the unfortunate, at least in English-speaking contexts, uh, with the unfortunate name of shit, or their Ghanaian counterparts who enjoy a similar fizzy drink called P-Cola, not so popular with tourists. 
Now, Everett Rogers spent his lifetime researching adoption and diffusion of innovations. And one of the cardinal lessons he drew out of thousands of studies was the need to think carefully about compatibility. How well does your innovation fit into the context in which you're planning to place it? The moral of this story. Well, first, creativity is a powerful motivator. And not least when your primary aim is getting recalcitrant children to school. We're fortunately hardwired for it. And our imaginations sometimes lead us to come up with and even try out crazy stuff. And as the Darwin Awards amply demonstrate, there is an element of natural selection involved which helps us avoid the really bad ideas. But not every wild idea is worthless. One of the early lessons I learned about creativity was the importance of what Tudor Ricards calls stepping stones. Those oddball ideas, strange in themselves, which serve to take our minds down different pathways and may lead us to somewhere useful. And framing matters in two directions. First, we need to hammer home the compatibility lesson taught us by Everett Rogers. Innovations don't exist in a vacuum, and we need to think about compatibility with the context in which we're placing them. But second, how far can we adapt the frame we place around an innovation? How far are we willing to stretch our own thinking and behavior to accommodate it? Think of the science fiction images of ideas like a smart wristwatch, which wakes you, talks to you, enables communication, acts as a map and a compass combined, and also tells you the time. Literally incredible, unbelievable, until we all started to buy and wear smart watches. But perhaps more than anything, we should also think of those innovations which started out as important, relevant and useful things, things which offered to make significant positive impact but which, like DDT and many other examples, later turned out to have negative consequences. Responsible innovation is the term used to describe the approach which involves carefully considering what innovations might do and trying to anticipate their possible unwanted side effects, and making sure we've got the capacity to shape and, if necessary, reshape them for good. Now, in an exploding world of innovation possibilities, like the one which AI is bringing, this looks like an essential rather than an optional approach to take.